The stream you have requested is currently unavailable. Please check the event listing, as the event has Thank either not started or is currently us. being prepared for on-demand viewing uh, and will be available uh, shortly. Probably about a year, and each time we do it, we get some sort of uh, phenomenal uh, customer doing some great things with uh, students in the education world. And Matt Brown is uh, definitely one of those. I've actually visited his classroom, spoken to his students there. Uh, it, it's very impressive, the type of uh, students that are he's, uh, he's teaching and the type of uh, men and women he's uh, sending off to the uh, college ranks. Um, but I'm not going to talk about Matt anymore. I'm going to focus on Stratasys. Um, so Stratasys, we've been around for uh, over 25 years. Um, you know, we were founder of the FDM technology. Uh, we recently merged with probably our best competitor, competitor, Object. And so now we are a company with over 1,200 employees, over 30,000 um, pieces of equipment installed at customer sites, and we are a, a, a big company with, with a big vision. And so uh, we definitely we feel we lead the way in 3D printing and additive manufacturing. We also feel that additive manufacturing is the future to what we're going to be doing um, from now, and it's changing how manufacturing is being done. Catch up with my slides. So see some um, awards that have been achieved by Stratus is it is a real company. We're based in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Um, and we really, really believe in the educational uh, world. We have over probably over 5,000 units in education, and that ranges from the elementary schools all the way up to the universities. Um, Matt is obviously in, in a high school. Um, but he also partners with a, a, a tech center in Colorado. Um, a lot of schools out there are adding to their repertoire when it comes to um, additive manufacturing. We're seeing a lot of schools develop uh, fabrication labs, uh, maker spaces, and direct digital labs. Uh, you see some of the schools on there with uh, multiple systems, and a lot of these multiple systems are they're doing that because they're creating a lab that all incoming engineering freshmen get access to. The key to all of this, uh, including with what Matt's going to talk about, is giving these students access to technology. Um, it really drives them to do more, uh, be more engaged. Um, even, you know, the, the fact that they can apply knowledge that they've learned in a book or on the computer screen and produce something with a 3D printer. We're seeing the technology that we manufacture being used in anything from the mechanical engineering world to the uh, machine tool, so a lot of manufacturing. Um, I've even seen a lot of anatomy, geography, um, art and animation being used with 3D printing because it really brings those, I guess, projects, curriculums, uh, classes to life. Um, one of the most popular things we're seeing right now is robotics and the, the fact that you can actually design something on the computer screen, print it out, and use it on a robot um, or whatever it is you're producing. It, it's, it's very exciting for a lot of people. Uh, schools, students, and teachers. Uh, you get that hands-on capability, that real workability, producing custom parts, doing something you couldn't do in any other way. Um, it's really exciting. And you'll hear from Matt how a lot of these competitions out there are changing the way students are learning and giving them access to industry leaders, um, giving them access to funding that you know allows them to do what they need to do. Uh, very exciting stuff, very exciting. You can just see here on this slide the, the fact that 3D printing is touching so many different types of companies, uh, from the automotive uh, to the aerospace, the consumer products, um, obviously with, with the education. But we're seeing a lot more medical, uh, dental, uh, 
even toys because people want to create something. They want a prototype, but then they want to test it. Uh, they want to put it out in the field. They want to see what the, the public reaction is. So having the capability to produce something in a matter of hours compared to a matter of weeks is it's, you can't put a dollar value on it for most of these companies because time is something that they can't purchase. Um, if you go on the Internet, you can even find in some of these companies that they've developed specific web pages just focused on their additive manufacturing capabilities. Uh, GE has a, a website out there that just talks about how they're using additive manufacturing and 3D printing in every step of their process. Boeing is doing the same, and like I said, they have a website out there. So they're not only promoting it to the public to show what they're doing, but they're also promoting it internally to their engineers saying, hey, guys, look what we have in terms of technology. Use it. Come to us. Let's produce your parts. We don't have to outsource everything. We can do some stuff internally where it can speed up your time to market. It can make your design better. It allows these engineers to take more chances and fail faster. You know, it's something, a word that not a lot of people love to hear is fail, but in, in the engineering world, the ability to fail fast means your product's going to get better faster. So um, the technology really allows for that. The way the technology works is we have two different uh, focus key technologies. We've got our polyjet matrix where it actually, uh, we jet uh, a liquid um, out of an inkjet head, so just like a, a paper printer, uh, but we flash that liquid with a UV light. So it's a UV cured uh, resin. And with that technology, we are extremely high detail. We have, uh, it's an extremely fast process, um, and it produces a, a beautiful part. Our other technology is the fused deposition modeling, or FDL. This is where we extrude a filament of plastic through a heated head. Uh, this plastic is deposited layer by layer, and it builds it up vertically. Um, the fused deposition, or the FDM technology, uses thermal plastics, so real thermal plastics. We have 10 different thermal plastics that we use with our 3D printers, our uh, lower cost systems, we focus on ABS, which is a, um, probably the world's most widely used thermoplastic in terms of injection mold. So what Legos are made out of, that's ABS plastic. And so those are the two technologies and how they, how they differ. Um, Matt will get into the, the fused deposition modeling a little more because he's got one of those printers. You see on this slide, there are so many different uh, key positives to each technology that Stratasys really gets to consult with people. You can find out what you're going to do most of the time, but we can steer you to, toward a, the technology that probably best fits what you want to do. But for thermoplastics, the key pieces are durable, it's functional, um, it's industry ready, and it, it is high performance. Like I said, to be able to put something on a robot and put it in a competition means these young students are doing direct digital manufacturing. So they're actually manufacturing key components to what they do. Uh, with the photopolymer polymers or the resins from the polyjet technology, uh, we can do rigid, we can do flexible or rubber line. So that, that's a key difference in, in a material structure capability that we can do. Um, then we have uh, medical we have some ISO certified materials being used in uh, dental applications, medical applications. And then uh, a key attribute that we have um, over any technology out there is the fact that we can digitally mix materials. So we can take um, some of our Vero material and mix it with our Tango material to get different uh, flexible um, value in these materials, which is a key component to a lot of concept 
prototypes, but then even in the research and design world. So having two technologies and a wide variety of materials allows Stratasys to be uh, in the forefront of really consulting to find out what, what people are looking for in the technology. Um, with the two technologies, we kind of have to divide them into a different areas. So we consider our lower cost 3D printers part of our idea series, where people are usually focusing on the concept. Our design series has seven different printers in it where these are more focused on a, a, a prototype and closer to the finished product prototype. And then we've got our production, our high-end Fortis pieces of equipment uh, where we actually have people producing products with it. So it's becoming a, a small manufacturing center, uh, a, a huge uh, shift in how the industries are, are producing things. They're changing from a, uh, a subtractive process uh, or an injection mold to sometimes they're printing uh, their, their English parts. Pretty exciting to, to see companies do that and to see companies be creative due to the fact that they can actually manufacture in their garage. And so you see the, the, the full printer line up here from idea series to design to production series. And then we kind of show a, a bit the chart there of 3D printers are, are more widely used for conceptual models. And as you go down the spectrum, the end use parts, uh, people are using the production systems uh, more so. Now I'm going to get into a couple different, uh, I guess, applications or areas where, where people are, are using our equipment um, with, with some, I think, attractive uh, pictures. Um, mechanical engineering, people, engineers, design engineers, students, researchers, checking for form, fit, and function. You know, they want to produce uh, what they've designed and they want to print it out. They want to test it. They want to put the electronics in it. They want to really, really use it um, before they go to the next steps with manufacturing. The manufacturing engineering, this is where people are producing uh, tools, um, jigs, fixtures, patterns, um, molds. Our equipment allows for those people to be very creative. Uh, the fact that they, you're building it up in an additive process allows for uh, much higher design flexibility. Um, and you see both technologies are used in a lot of different tools. This is a, a very fast-growing area of our company due to the fact that it impacts companies immediately right away. We see some architectural and civil, civil engineering. Uh, the fact that uh, I always refer to the Brady Bunch and uh, how Mike Brady used to make his, uh, all the houses look the same, but he'd make them out of cardboard, and that's what somebody would be assembling that. Now people can take it directly from their CAD drawing and produce it on a 3D printer. That means they're not spending the time doing the production of this um, prototype or model. Uh, the, the machine is doing it. Uh, so a lot more creativity being used. Art, jewelry, design, we, we're seeing more of this and more of this every year. Um, and I think it's due to the fact that a lot more of the designers um, getting into this have a digital background, uh, a CAD-based background, where they know how to draw and design on the computer. And so a 3D print is just a, a next logical step. I get very proud of uh, how much we work in the medical and biomedical area because um, our company is directly impacting um, lives, you know, ma making lives better, assisting in surgeries, um, anything from, as you see in, in the top there, middle there, the conjoined twins with a, a surgeon will print out a model and have a very, very good idea of exactly what they want to do before they even enter a surgery. So the fact that they can take a CT scan or an MRI and convert it to something that's printable allows them to make 
you know, better decision um, to prosthetics, to tools used in the operating room. Um, very exciting stuff. If we're talking cool, you know, you got to look at uh, art and entertainment. Uh, the fact that a lot of these companies, even though their entire movies are CGI, so um, computer generated, um, they want to hold stuff. They want to feel stuff. Uh, they want to touch stuff. They want to see how the shadows, um, the shadows lay when the sun's on a specific side. And then on top of it, even the actors and the actresses, they want to hold the equipment. They, they want to wear the suit so their body naturally moves like it would if they're in a suit. And so uh, we're seeing a lot more of this. this uh, there's a lot of 3D scanning and 3D printing being used in the creation of film and entertainment. Um, my final slide uh, is focused on education. This is what my passion is. Um, as a former teacher, I know what it's like to get a piece of uh, equipment in a classroom. Uh, but if it's a, a piece of equipment that is not intuitive or hard to use or constantly breaking down, it's not a tool, it's a burden. That's one thing that I, I'm very proud of with the Stratasys product is it's impacting schools in a positive manner. It's an output device. Schools are usually... Uh, most of them have 3D CAD right now, and they're teaching it. The kids are excited to, to use it. But to get that final piece, an actual piece that they can hold, touch, feel, evaluate, that, that means these students are getting to do what engineers do on a daily basis. If, you, if we can change anything about the school systems, we need it to be more hands-on. And I think our product um, allows for that. It does take a special instructor to make it real, to bring it to life, to continue to do new things. Um, and I, I do believe our, our next speaker is, is one of those. But as you see here, it's anything from robotics to designing products to, um, if you see in the middle there, that's an actual rotor for a centrifuge uh, helping in the research world. It's a very, very exciting uh, aspect of, of what we do working with the, the educational realm. So, um, with that, I think uh, I'd love to pass it back to Kanoa. Thank you very much, Jesse. Excellent job. And now, folks, it's time to hear from our next speaker, Matt Brown. Matt, take it away. Hello. Um, let me get the right slide up here. All right, there we go. Hello, my name is Matthew Brown. I am a STEM teacher from um, Lakewood, Colorado. I teach at both uh, um, at uh, Lakewood High School and at Warren Tech. Um, I have been teaching for about 10 years now, and I've been using uh, 3D printers or uh, Dimension 3D printers since 2006. Um, kind of talk about what I'm gonna what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about what I teach and how I got to using. Uh, or even became interested in looking at dimension printers um, and how we progress through using different printers. Uh, talk about how we use these as student projects, some of the activities that we do, um, how I've created partnerships, and actually how the printer has actually created partnerships. It's uh, something that uh, it, it attracts attention and uh, people are interested in it. Uh, and then, again, how we have used this with our project working with uh, NASA with the NASA Hunch program. So first, what do I teach? Um, I've been teaching since 2003. I started teaching AutoCAD and construction uh, and then added a renewable energy program and sustainability um, in the first couple of years. In 2006, we built a new school here at Lakewood High School and um, had the opportunity to get some new equipment. And after doing some serious research, I decided that a 3D printer would be a valuable tool that we need to have. Um, at the time, um, nobody else in our district had one, so I didn't have anybody to talk to, even our technical schools, Red Rocks Community College. Uh, nobody had anything like this that they were using. So I kind of I made sure I did my research. I looked at a couple of different types of printers um, and you know, kind of came to the conclusion of where we are now. Um, I've used this printer with uh, Project Lead the Way, and I'm currently teaching the STEM Academy. 
Um, I use the 3D printer in my sustainability classes and in my renewable energy classes. Kids can prototype ideas, uh, sustainability designs. I combine my sustainability with my engineering, so students are using different materials, different designs um, in, in their process and in their projects. And then with the, the NASA Hunch project, our entire project is built on the 3D printer. And it's, it's really kind of a neat tool, and I'll talk more about NASA Hunch once I get to that slide. Um, let's see here. There's a little slag in the, in the printer here, or in the, in the presentation. How do I use this printer in my program? Um, <clears throat> We started with the BST 1200 in 2006. Uh, we um, wanted to get in, kind of. A, we worked to deal with uh, with the guys here in our in our that were selling printers in our areas, and we got you know, using school money and I got some CTE money. We were able to put a printer in here. Uh, I looked at a lot of different types of printers. Uh, obviously, there are more options now than there were then. Um, so really, there were uh, there was the um, the granular material with the uh, with the adhesives in it, and there were some that were slicing up thin pieces of plastic that were glued together. And I really I really like the um, the BST the dimension because it gave us a final product that was pretty durable. I mean, we could the kids could take it and add it into whatever piece of equipment they were building it for and test it. They could drill it, they could tap it, they can sand it, they can paint it. It's it's pretty versatile. It gives us a lot of opportunity for students to uh, manipulate it once they have a product in their hand. Uh, we really changed from a, a traditional industrial arts program here to more of a design and build engineering base. We kept a lot of the same classes. We just changed our, our function a little bit, and we incorporated the printer into all of it. Uh, we use it in our architecture class, like Jesse showed, the, the houses, uh, the buildings, the models. Uh, students were building house models on our printer as well as um, the uh, um, like the, the engineering or the uh, uh, what am I thinking here the like the NASA projects uh, puzzle cubes some of the other um, uh, engineering types of, of projects um, in 2012 after I'd started a partnership with Warren Tech we purchased a Fortis uh, 250 uh, which is a soluble support machine uh, uses the ABS plus gives us a lot more um, opportunity to do intricate products uh, was one of the things with the BST. Um, I, as my students became more and more comfortable with the machine and what they could do with it, they really pushed the limits. And we found with really intricate pieces of, a, uh, of or intricate parts that we were they were struggling to get all the material or the, all the support material off without damaging parts. But then the Fortis came into into play, and we were able to use a soluble. Uh, support, which made it a lot easier to do very intricate um, parts for for NASA. For uh, we had a student that designed a boat which had with the ropes on the decking and all kinds of really really delicate pieces that came out beautifully. And I think Jesse, actually, you guys have a, a copy of that in your one of your display cases, if I remember. Um, so it was a neat progression to see the students go from being, wow, look at this really cool thing, to it becoming a part of the classroom and students using it as a tool. Um, at first, everyone was standing watching it build, <laughs> which, you know, once it lays down a couple of layers, it's the same thing over and over again. Um, but after a while, they became used to it and uh, made it a real big part of, of our program. Activities, projects, benefits to students. Uh, I can't talk enough about this piece. Um, we've uh, done all kinds of projects from when the students first come into my engineering class, the first thing we do is, is teach them how to use our, uh, the 3D design software, whether it's AutoCAD or SolidWorks or whatever. And one of the projects we do right off the bat is a puzzle cube. Um, it's, a, it's a project lead the way for, uh, project that the students get to design a little puzzle cube and then we print the parts out on the on the 3D printer so they get to actually see um, and hold and put together the puzzle that they created. Uh, now there's a lot of 
checking and, and everything before we print to make sure that there's no interference, everything's going to fit. They actually build it out of wood first, the wood, wood blocks, make sure everything works, and then they have this final product that they, they can take and the, the, ver the variety of colors. We can print all the parts out in different colors, and they take it home and give it to their, their siblings. It's just a, it's a neat project that the kids really enjoy working on. Um, I think them being able to design something in the software and then be able to have it built in something as sturdy as ABS plastic to be able to touch it, to test it, modify it um, if they need to, like I said, sand it or drill it or um, put it into whatever component, you know, whatever device they're building and test it. I think that adds a lot of value and the level of student understanding goes up. They can see it actually working. It's not all just theory. Um, we work on, on real world designs with clients where the you know local businesses come in and, and, and take on projects with the students. Um, so they get to work with, with real engineers that work in their office most of the time and come in and they'll bring a project in for the students to work on and um, then they get to use the printer as part of their part of the deal, which is kind of a neat little trade off. Some of the student projects that we've worked on, um, we have a, there's a little handheld uh, controller over here on the side that is kind of made as a, this is part of one of our NASA projects. It's a, it's a little, almost like a Game Boy. They purchased all of the electronics from uh, a place called SparkFun. They built, they designed the whole um, device on in SolidWorks and then we built it on the printer. They assembled it, they wired it up, they made it work. And that's what controlled their experiment uh, when we flew it in zero gravity last year. Um, the item on the right, the orange thing, is what was called the egg refuge, and it could actually crack the egg in zero gravity and, and, and extract an egg from its shell. And so this handheld device controlled the egg refuge and made it do its thing. So it was a neat, a neat project. It worked on Earth. Um, uh, extracting an egg in zero gravity is a little different. <laughs> it was an interesting, interesting experiment to try. We've also had, uh, and Jesse touched on this too, the whole robotics thing. Um, we have a student that um, actually uh, did a finger. He re replicated a finger in all the joints and um, and can put a, it wired it to a glove, electronic glove, so that when he moved his finger, it actually moved the finger. Uh, the fake finger as well. So it was kind of a neat electronics, combination of electronics and the use of the 3D printer at the same time. So that was a, a neat project. And, you know, something else that Jesse touched on was the whole failure thing. Um, these kids are taught for from the time they're really little that failure is bad, and then when they get to an engineering class uh, and failure happens, they freak. Um, so I, I think that failure is a, is a good thing, and, and this is a safe place for that to happen. Uh, it's better to happen now than out where the consequences are higher. So, and it, this does expedite that to give them more opportunity um, to fail, learn from that, fix it, make it right, and and then have something to be really proud of. Have a lot of buy-in, uh, a lot of ownership uh, when it comes to your final product. And they've looked back and said, "Wow, you know, I've over, I overcame a lot to accomplish this and to achieve this, and this and this is my final product." So. Um, in that way, it's really helpful and, and benefits students quite a bit. I'm creating partnerships. This is this thing; it, it sells itself. Um, when we first bought the machine, um, I, I really saw it as a, as a tool to have in the classroom, a way for students to build models. Um, but then people started talking about it. Students are going home and telling their parents about it. Kids that weren't even in my program were talking about it. And then all of a sudden I had parents that were engineers coming to me and saying, hey, I hear you have a 3D printer. I'd really like to see that sometime. <laughs> and so they'd come in and um, say, wow, I could really use this for this kind of product or to do this kind of project. And so the wheel started turning in my head. It's like, well, okay, you bring it in and you work with a few of my students on a design and you know, I'll let you use the printer and, you know, you just pay for the material that you use and we'll call it good. And uh, th that just exploded. And, and I had business people coming and wanting to work with kids and, you know, so the kids got to see real world application of their of the skills they were learning in the class. Um, they got to work with real engineers and see what they really do on a day-to-day -day basis. 
um, they got to have some say. I mean, some of the students actually designed things for these engineers that they then took and used in their business, and they became parts of things of real projects that they were working on. Uh, we had a group of students that designed a, a game case for um, a video game console for um, a cruise line, and they went to their trade show, and these kids, you know, kind of got famous because of it, which was kind of cool. So there are a lot of a lot of benefits. Um, the accountability for students. I mean, they, they when you do a theoretical project, you say, well, imagine this is happening and we have to solve this problem. There's really, the, you know, what are the consequences? But when you have a, a client that's coming in, he's got a real project he's working on, you need to meet your deadlines. You need to do your work and double check things and make sure everything is the way it needs to be. And when you don't, when you do fail, there are real consequences. Um, so that piece of it, I think, has a real impact on uh, on students, and it affects not just the students, but in what they learn, but how they behave in class. The professionalism, the level of professionalism of my students has gone up. Uh, I had somebody ask me the other day, you know, how do you deal with discipline problems in your classroom? And I had to think for a second. It's like I really don't have discipline problems. My kids are engaged, they're involved, they're working on it, and I owe a lot of that um, to this piece of equipment. I mean, it's. Um, without that, it changes everything about how I how I run my class. Um, it is by far the most valuable piece of equipment that I have in my classroom. Um, it's easy to use. Kids can kids can use it. They can pull the pieces out. They can start right from the get go and and do what they need to do with it. Um, NASA had came into the picture a couple of years ago, about five years ago, and. Um, said, hey, we need to have some experiments up on the International Space Station. And so I said, sure, let's do that. That sounds really neat. And my students started designing a plant chamber. Um, after interviewing uh, an astronaut that had just come down off the ISS after being up there for six months, he said that the one thing that um, affected him the most in space was not having anything green and, and nothing to care for, no plant life at all. It's like living in a big computer. Um, so they wanted to go and figure out a way to give the astronauts plant life to take care of on the ISS, and so they designed the hydrofuge. Um, and uh, that became a whole new thing. <laughs> it really kind of took off with our with our uh, our uh, program and, and and did a lot for kids. We have kids that are in, in, in uh, aerospace engineering programs because of this project. Um, on this slide, you can see some of the pictures that this picture on the left is a picture of my students working with a professor from Colorado School of Mines, Dr. Angel Madrid, and that is our first version of the hydrofuge that he's going over with them. He does a lot with zero gravity flights, and having seen what we've done with um, 3D printers, is he's started to incorporate that into his program as well uh, on a little bit different level. Uh, the students on the on the right are working with an engineer from the company that designs the uh, uh, the, co the game console for the cruise ships, and that's the actual console laying on the table. He had he had taken their shell, their their console, and put all the guts in it, and brought it back with the touch screen working, and showing them how it was all going to, in the end, how it was going to go to the trade show. So um, it has a huge impact on these kids. The the level of pride, the sense of ownership, the self esteem that it builds. Um, it, it speaks volumes. So our our, uh, our NASA experiment. Um, this is the banner, the actual banner that was on the zero gravity flight this year, and you can see some of the other sponsors that we have that we've brought into this. Obviously, there's Stratasys, and we have Colorado Aquaponics, and a group called the Big Tomato. Um, there are some others that have come in too because of. You know, the, the level that these students are working at is, is just phenomenal. So when it comes to the the experiments in space, um, I think the big thing, first of all, was teaching the kids that things are a little different here on Earth than they are up there, and doing research on how things react. We had to get the, get the plastic okayed by NASA uh, from the printer and make sure that it was something that we could use, and not just the zero gravity flights, but up on the ISS, and I think, I don't know if they've taken one yet or if they're think, still thinking about taking one, but there was talk of a, of a 3D printer going up on the ISS to see how it works in space. Um, so it, it's been a, a really neat opportunity. These students designed this centrifugal plant chamber 
um, that can be scaled to accept different plants, um, different size. You can you can have a whole farm of these things if you want. So it's it's modular. They they snap together, um, and we've tested it. Um, four times now in zero gravity, and we've been accepted by NanoRacks, which is the company that builds the, uh, the equipment for space travel from the ground up to the ISS. They build all the equipment and they manage that stuff for, for NASA. So they have accepted us. We're on a, we have a manifest. We just need to, to get our funding together, and, and it's ready to go to the ISS. Um, it's just been an incredible opportunity for students. I've had students that have done internships with NASA. Um, and they've been invited to come and, and speak to other groups down there, and I owe a lot of that to the equipment that they've been able to, to use. It's made this a lot more doable for these students, whereas other teams that, that come down have got to have, they've got to farm out equipment, or I mean parts to be made, so they don't make all their parts. They'll have to send some of their stuff out to machine shops or, or whatever because they don't have uh, a piece, this piece of equipment available to them, and so when the other teachers are seeing what my students have, it's like, how did you build that? It's oh, a 3D printer, and we start talking about how it works, and they're just amazed that you know the kids designed and built everything from scratch, from the ground up. It's all 100% student designed, built, tested, and ready to go. They didn't have to rely on um, outside uh, groups for any of their parts, which was kind of nice. Um, Let's see. So here's a picture of, uh, or two pictures actually, of our of the hydrofuge. Um, the one on the left, the red, white, and blue, and was the original. Uh, after we built it and tested it, it worked, uh, and that's all. That's all ABS plastic built on our 3D printer in in uh, several different parts, and then the students assembled it. Um, after we tested this in zero gravity, uh, they said it's too big. It needs to go from 10 inches by 10 inches by 8 inches to 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 15 centimeters, which is quite a difference. Um, and also, we also want to have it so that it's automated. So we started working with um, working with Spark Fund and getting parts to automate it. The students you know, went to the drawing board and designed and tested, and we built several of these things on different levels. It was. Uh, it was quite a feat for them to take that big thing and shrink it down. So um, last test, the one on the right was tested this past, well, about two weeks ago, actually, in zero gravity, and it tested successfully. Everything worked. So our next step is the ISS. Uh, so here are some students, pictures of students at Ellington Field down at Johnson Space Center working on the hydrofuge, getting it ready to go to, onto the zero gravity plane. Because we were working with water in our device, this is, it's all watertight, um, we had to double contain it, so we had to have a separate Lexan box um, that it was installed inside just in case there were leaks, which there weren't, so it was all successful and everything worked. Um, and then here's the team in zero gravity. You can see them floating on the right there. And then there's the plane with the students in front of it on the left. Um, that in itself is an amazing experience for students. Um, the uh, first year we went to Houston, I had a student who's a senior. He had no idea what he wanted to do with his life. Um, after he came off the plane, he said, I don't know what I want to do now. So it changed everything about what he uh, what direction he was headed. He went to the University of Washington. He's in the aerospace engineering program, just completed a, um, an internship at um, Kennedy, uh, uh, at, at a Kennedy Space Center on the Deep Space Project. He's got inroads there because of this project and what it's done for him. So it's been a really neat opportunity, and um, the, the Dimension Printer has been a huge piece of what we do in our program here at both Lakewood and Warren Tech. So that's all that I have. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Kanoi. That was wonderful. Thank you, Matt. What a cool story. I got a. I was writing mad notes as you were talking. Um, I, I loved how this technology changed how students, you know, look at their futures or open doors to really interesting internships, and I, I think it's just fantastic.
And apparently our audience agrees. Uh, we've got a number of questions waiting for us in the queue, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, we've got one coming in now, and Matt, I'm going to toss this out to you first, but uh, Jesse, you should definitely feel to, to chime in. Um, we've got someone who's looking to purchase a printer for their classroom, but they don't have a lot of money to spend. Um, what kinds of funding ideas do you have? You asking me first? Sure. Okay. Um, well, I ran into a similar similar problem. Um, I had a certain budget that I had to spend on a, on a new shop when we built our new school, and it, um, with all the other equipment that I had to buy, I didn't have enough. So I, I worked with our, very closely with our CE, CTE department. Um, there were even some suggestions of partnering with our local community college um, and doing something. But uh, between, I was fortunate I, uh, between our the money I had left from my from our new school and our CTE department, we were able to um, purchase a system. Now, and our system was used. It was a demo model, so that was another thing that helped us is um, we were able to purchase a demo model. Um, but par partnering with, um, with your local community college can really help. In fact, they came after I purchased my printer and were very excited to see what I was using it for, and then subsequently they purchased a, a soluble support machine themselves not, not long after that. But, um, I'd say grants, there are a lot of grants out there that I've seen that um, are talking about there that are there for the use of 3D printing or similar technologies. Great, thank you. Jesse, yeah, do you I, want to add anything? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll piggyback on that. Uh, Matt hit it on the head. The, the, the partnerships, you know, he partnered with the, his local community college. We're, we have customers that partner with local businesses. So they'll they'll kind of fundraise that way, and they'll give the businesses access to the printer or to print parts for them at non-busy times. It's a great way to create that community relationship, potential internships, uh, and gather funding. Um, the grants out there, like Matt said, there's a lot of 3D printing grants, a lot of manufacturing grants, robotic grants. Uh, Perkins funding uh, can be used for 3D printers because it is uh, technology, um, a, a piece of technology, and that's what Perkins funding is known for. And then, you know, we even have some schools partnering with other schools because the, the, some of the printers are uh, easy enough to transport when they well, they they will share it, or they'll buy it for district, and they'll use it in three different schools, a couple of middle schools and high school. So creativity is key. A uh, people with with drive and initiative, because you know you do have to fight for the funding, but there are a lot of different avenues out there. And then, like Matt said, we have demo equipment that we we do sell, um, and then we also do leasing as well, where we can spread out payments for over five years. Great, thank you. Now, this one's going to go to you also. Um, we've got someone who wants to know, how can we incorporate such a 3D printer into a learning commons and inspire teachers to bring this into their classroom? What advice do you have for this listener? Um, well, it can be used a lot of different ways. I mean, when Jesse was talking about you know, all the different, you know, the biomedical, the, I mean, it applies to science, you can do things with math, um, you can, obviously, the engineering and the, and the technology aspects are there. I've, I've used it in my in my um, in my renewable energy, my sustainability classes as well. I think, man, just having having teachers come and play with it a little bit and try it out and use it and let them kind of brainstorm their own ideas. I mean, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even tell them what what they need to use it for. But hey, just come in here and let me show you how this works and build a couple of parts and. Think about how you can use this in your program. The applications for this are, are limitless. Um, I would think that uh, you're going to find you have a lot of teachers that would be able to use this in their classroom and, and would enjoy incorporating this. Um, well, does that answer the question? It does. It does. And that actually leads right into the next one, um, which sort of piggybacks on this, which is, do you have to be an engineering student or a science teacher in order to use this 3D printer? Can a librarian use it in the Learning Commons, and is it practical? Um, a librarian? Gee, I've never thought of that, but I'm, I'm sure you could find something. Um, well, I think that just uh, getting kids using this equipment, no matter what it's for, encourages creativity. 
I think having them be able to, to create something, print it out and hold it in their hands and, and see what it looks like, an idea that came from their head that now they can hold in their hands, I mean, that going from, from their head to their hands is, is quite a jump, and I think most students, um, that excites them and that gets them really more interested in whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, so I think that, the, you know, the, the tool sells itself. It, 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 is something that attracts students. They're they're interested. They're curious about it. They like to watch it. We we'll use this at my as a recruiting tool for my um, for our program, and I'll take it out on freshman night. And the kids just gather around. They can't help themselves. It's <laughs> they just come. They want to see what it is, how it's how it's working. They want to hold the parts. They want to put them together. They're putting the puzzle cubes out there. They'll they'll put them together. So I think it, it is something that will attract students. It is. Um, it's something that interests them. So um, how a librarian would use it, I'd have to think about that. But I'm sure that there would be a way that you could. <laughs> I, I really like that idea of getting sort of outside of the box of science and engineering in order um, to use this, uh, this type of technology. And going to, to that effect, um, Jesse, did you want to chime in on this question also? You, you mentioned earlier that you'd seen a number of applications of 3D printers. Did you want to add to this of, of some other creative uses for the classroom and other um, subjects? Absolutely, Kanoi. Um, absolutely, you know, when I hear that question, I, I, I think of kind of it's more of can a, would a librarian be able to use it in the library? And absolutely, the systems are, are simple to use. They're clean. It's basic power. There's no uh, fumes or anything like that. And so all of that this librarian would need was to have the students to be able to create the 3D CAD models. And we do have a lot of libraries out there that are starting to put in 3D printers in their common areas. Um, and especially at the university level because they know certain students may not be in a mechanical engineering class with access to a 3D printer, but have the skills to create a 3D digital file that can be printed. So absolutely, because we're seeing these, some of these libraries kind of use it as they do in an inkjet printer. You know, they can print their documents there and, you know, it may be a lab fee or something like that, but, but absolutely. And then it does get those students that aren't per se involved directly in an area where they have access to a 3D printer access. That it makes sense? Yes. Yeah, I think that's a very good application there um, and a good way of looking at it, you know, how it can be used in more common ways. Um, Matt, this one's for you. How many students were working on these hydrofuge projects? <laughs> um, a lot. It, this has been a project that's been going on for uh, five years now. Four years we've tested it in zero gravity. And every year I've got a new, well, there are some students that transfer from year to year, um, but uh, you know, probably 80%, 85% of the students every year are new. So I have, oh, about 30 students a year that are working on this. This next year I'm expanding um, this project into all of my engineering, the, the hunch piece, into all of my engineering projects. So I will um, triple the number of students next year that will be that have their hand in the NASA hunch project on a lot of different levels, from design to um, students that are doing uh, brainstorming and, and working on the design process and coming up with new solutions and um, just getting more minds on the project. Uh, I think gives you a better solution in the end. So we'll have. Over the years, probably, oh, 200 kids so far, roughly, that have worked on this project, so. I think that's fantastic, and you are an extraordinarily patient man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, next question is, what kind of software packages are compatible with these printers? Is it only CAD, or does it work with Maya or 3D Max? And perhaps, Jesse, did you want to start this one, or however you guys want to do that? Yeah, okay. oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Basically, any 3D CAD package will suffice as long as you can produce an STL, and so that's the file format, .STL. 3DS Max, absolutely. Maya, absolutely. Even some of the free softwares out there, like Google SketchUp, uh, you can create an STL file. So anybody that's searching or trying to find out how to do it, just go in and see if you can do it as a file, save as STL, or export as STL. If you can't find it, 
I guarantee you somebody online has posted something somewhere uh, about that. So Bing it, Google it, Yahoo it, uh, just convert whatever software you have to .sdl format. Nice. How recyclable are thermoplastics and photopolymers? I guess I'll answer that. Uh, the, the thermoplastics we use are it's ABS, so uh, we have um, documentation based on how to recycle it. You cannot recycle it and then reuse it in your printer, but it is absolutely something that is recyclable uh, as it is uh, a, a thermoplastic. Uh, some of the parts that are used, for instance, uh, cartridges or spools, um, and even uh, our bases that must be printed on, uh, we do have recycling numbers on them. So you can check via your municipality to see how uh, they can be recycled. But most of our recycling, we just do in a, in a standard recycling method. Okay, great. Matt, I want to toss this next one back to you. Um, we've got some folks that are interested in knowing sort of your purchase criteria for choosing the Dimension printer. The question is, why did you choose the Dimension printer over other types of printers? We know you had actually started with a different one, I think. So what made you finally go with this particular model? Um, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to throw other names out here or not if I get in trouble, but one of the first ones I looked at was a Z Corp um, in the which, and it produces nice models, but they were fragile. If you drop them, they can break. Um, and so the criteria that we had is it had to be something that was durable. I wanted the kids to be able to handle it and, and test it. That was the big thing. Testing was probably one of the most important things. They've got to be able to put it into whatever situation they designed it for and see if it works. Um, and if that takes some, some extra drilling or they've got to put, they've got to put screws in it or, or bolts through it or whatever, they were able to do that with this type of, of plastic. So for them to have a model they can actually um, use and test without destroying it, that was, uh, that was probably the, the, the driving, uh, those are the driving criteria right there. Got it. Okay, great. Um, Jesse, this one is for you. Can you tell us, you mentioned a number of different models earlier, but what are the most popular Stratasys 3D printers in school? Well, that's a great question. Um, our most popular 3D printer is probably the Ukraine. Jesse, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Um, we're running into some noise. Is that better? That's a bit better. You're a bit warbly. I apologize. Uh, our most popular three printers are the Uprint Plus system. Uh, they're a nice 8 by 8 by 6 build envelope, um, small, really easy to use. Um, and they're affordable. Um, so those are the most popular today, and but that that's ranging from middle schools on up uh, that are purchasing those. Uh, our second most popular is probably the, the one that Matt has uh, the Fortis 250MC because it allows you uh, a lot more control of uh, you, what you're printing from the internal uh, layers to contours to uh, road, road thicknesses and then even com completing a soluble model rather than the actual build model so you can do a, a, a wrap or a core. Got it. Got it. Good. Um, Matt, this one is for you. What software did you use to create the design um, from your idea or for your idea? Uh, we've actually used two different types of software. Um, our students get to use um, um, Autodesk Inventor or AutoCAD, and we also used a lot of uh, SolidWorks as well. SolidWorks has been the, the software of late that kids have um, done most of their work on. Terrific. And folks, that takes us to just about the top of the hour. So we did have a few other questions that we didn't get to, not to worry. We are handing these questions over to our sponsor, Stratasys, and they will be following up with you on this. Um, but like I said, we're just about out of time. I'd like to say thank you to Matt and Jesse for your terrific presentations and, uh, and to Stratasys for sponsoring today's event.
I'd also like to remind our listeners today that in the next day or two, we will be emailing you a link to the archived version of this webcast so you can review it or pass it on to a colleague. And with that, we thank you very much for attending. This concludes today's webcast.